Hello, and welcome to Question in a Bottle. In this series of short discussions, private investor Mark Atkinson answers questions sent in by listeners and subscribers to his main podcast, The Desert Island Investor. So, let's take a look and see what's in the bottle that washed up on the beach today. Right, we have a question from Paul Igor. Uh, who is a friend and supporter of the digital investor and an experienced investor in his own right. Thanks, Paul. And he asks, Mark, what has been your worst investment disasters over the years? What did you learn from it? And after your investment disasters, did you make any changes with your investment style from it? Well, I have to say, uh, thanks for the question, Paul, but what are you trying to do to me? Um, I'm trying to expunge these things from my memory. Uh, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in again. I'll probably wake up uh, dripping and sweat and panic attacks. In all seriousness, the good thing about looking at past bad experiences is that all that we can do is learn from them. Uh, this year will be my 40th anniversary of when I first started investing in equities. I was 18, barely out of childhood. And looking back, I knew very little about investing and frankly, little about anything else other than perhaps um, the offside rule and, and Linda Carter who played Wonder Woman. Firstly, uh, having losers is part and parcel of equity investing. I think that all your, if you, you know, if you think that all your investments will be winners, then I would suggest that you're in for a rude awakening. Uh, people often feel crestfallen or a, a failure because of a losing position. Now, these are the terms of engagement. Uh, the good news is that with equity investing, the odds are stacked in your favor. The most you can lose is 100%. And conversely, there's no ceiling to the upside. Theoretically, a share could increase in value indefinitely. I've been investing for 40 years, and I can assure you uh, that I've had, and that I will continue to have my share of losers. Uh, we always hope and strive to limit that number, but I accept that there will be some investments that don't succeed. I have a broad basket approach and looking at the portfolio, if I review, say, over the commonest period of time, one year, some will have gone backwards and it will be of little surprise. I don't beat myself up. Obviously, I try and learn and mitigate where possible. I would be very sceptical of anybody that claims never to have any losers, especially somebody selling their tips or their strategy with a free bottle of snake oil with every purchase. Uh, it's easy for me to, to share my disappointments. I'm not selling a service for which you could expect a certain performance level uh, and uh, I have nobody to report to. I can't get sacked. The Desert Island Investor is simply a, a report of my activity or, or limited activity that some may find interesting or entertaining and they might see some approach that they'd like to adopt or learn from or learn from one of my many, many mistakes. Um, I've used the, the word loser a, a few times and uh, Paul has used the word disaster. Uh, and as I've said, I've had a lot of losers, but in fairness, I've had very few disasters, and by that, I mean losers that were big positions. Uh, one stands out before all others. Uh, in the past, I have made two very large gains out of James Cropper PLC, who are a paper manufacturer, and this is an industry I worked in. On the first occasion, I sold out and took my profits. I banked them. Uh, they say it's never a bad thing to, to take a profit. And when you are a position that has grown and your portfolio is lopsided, you often feel that you should take some, affir some affirmative action. This was a stock and an industry I felt I knew well. So where did I go with the lion's share? I went for the comfort and security of a FTSE blue chip, FTSE 100 blue chip, RBS. Gone were the risks of having all that capital in a small cap. Uh, this was more PC plod. I would just sit back and take the juicy dividends. Uh, in addition, I felt the world was, was overbanked and there could be some consolidation and the R RBS would, would play a part in it. On that score, I was at least right. And uh, RBS acquired ABN AMRO, uh, a Dutch bank, for I think it was uh, 71 billion euros. 
This was just in time to coincide with the 2008 banking crisis and there was blood running down the walls. All that gain, gone. Um, when I exited from, from RBS, I, th I think it was about around a 90% loss. Um, the second part of, of Paul's question is what did I learn? Well, several things. Um, size is not necessarily safer. Uh, what does Mark Atkinson know about banking? Uh, not enough. Uh, I recently uh, took a look at the latest Lloyd's annual report, just out of interest, and it's 362 pages long. And uh, from for myself, and I would suggest uh, many other people, it, it's, it's it's impenetrable. You know what what chance do we have? Then, as my friend uh, Jeremy McEwen says, banks are like football clubs. The players walk away with all the money, bankers' bonuses. Now, not only the, the bonus itself, but, but given the rewards, it, it's little surprise that employees cut corners and, and circumvent controls in order to trigger that bonus. There, there always seems to be some form of banking scandal coming down the track, followed by compensation and punitive fines. Um, it's, it, it's an industry prone to government interference. Uh, during COVID, banks, unlike other industries, were, were directed not to pay out dividends to, to maintain liquidity. And there's often the looming prospect of, of a windfall tax at the, at the top end of the cycle. So stick to something I can clearly understand and have some command of, I would think. Um, th this sense of locking in a gain by moving it somewhere else is, is largely folly. Um, and also on diversification. I, I, I do not need to have something in every sector. I don't have to have a bank, an insurer, a house builder, a high steep retailer etc etc clearly some sectors are better than others and i un understand some better than others and and there's many that i can avoid altogether so a, a, a different scenario and one a little closer to the present day um covid came along now i would argue that for anybody with anything resembling a broad portfolio they would have been extremely lucky if they not experienced some collateral damage. Uh, throughout, I was pretty relaxed and, and came out uh, very satisfactorily. However, I did have one casualty, uh, not the size of RBS, but it sat in the in the top third of the portfolio, Cineworld. So the investment case uh, is that it's 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 relatively cheap way to entertain yourself. Uh, the big screen and the sound. Are, and being in a collective audience is, is more of an experience. There's very few staff, uh, certainly any that command a, a large salary. You, your customers are direct to a, to a screen and require uh, little or no attention. And, and the building is, is, is like a glorified warehouse. Uh, it's good for advertising because you literally have a captive audience. They can't flick over to the other side. And then there's the retail side of, of refreshments and sweets where the, the margins are enormous and, and even the 3D glasses, which people never keep. For a business like this, a lot of the costs are fixed. Every extra bum on a seat goes straight through to the bottom line. Against this, uh, there's a plethora of channels via home viewing, uh, Netflix, Amazon, etc., and the fact that, that a cinema chain, it's no control over the content. They can only show the movies that other have, others have made. So then Cineworld decided to go for a couple of massive game-changing acquisitions in, in North America, and in the process, leverage up to the hilt with debt. As I've said before, debt is often a killer. Uh, the strategy may have worked, but what comes along, COVID, lockdown, um, and being sat in a cinema with hundreds of people is a no-no. So we didn't know how long COVID would be with us. Um, would the lockdown approach be maintained or would there be a sense that some stage soon we'd have to return to normal? Anyway, it, it dragged on. Cineworld scrambled around trying to find a, a way to survive and I sold out just before the death for a few crumbs and I'm not trying to dress this up as anything more than a, than the, the than a total write off. For me, it's a hundred percent write off. What did I learn from this? Um, probably what I already knew that, that debt is a killer. Uh, you can't go bust if you've, you've got net cash. If I hadn't owned it at that stage, I doubt that I would have bought into the business. Uh, but because I'd already owned it, I was prepared to stay on board. 
So perhaps that is one of the failings of my uh, interfere as little as possible strategy. So I think I need to learn that if the story changes with one of my investments and there's a departure from the criteria that I went through during the screening process, then I do need to be more critical in my thinking and action and not retain um, a business just because it's already made it through to the portfolio. So um, thanks for your question, Paul. Uh, it's made me think and reflect. And uh, all I need to do now is ask you for your address so I can send you the, the invoice for the, uh, the therapy and the counselling that I feel I now need to go through. Well, that's all for this episode. We hope that you enjoyed it. Please remember the content is for information only and it is not financial advice. If you have a question for Mark for our Question in a Bottle podcast, just complete the form on our website, thedesertislandinvestor.co.uk. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.